Greetings to you all. It is my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker today on behalf of the World Council for Gifted and Talented Children. But more importantly, I am humbled to have this opportunity to introduce you to our speaker on behalf of my home country, Aotearoa, New Zealand. Melinda Weber is Tongata Whenua, which literally means people of the land. And she is of Ngāti Pākau, Ngāpui, and Ngāti Kahu descent. Melinda is an Associate Professor at the University of Auckland's Faculty of Education and Social Work in New Zealand. She is a former Fulbright Ngāpai scholar who has published widely on the nature of Māori identity. Melinda's research examines the ways race, ethnicity, culture and identity impact the lives of young people, particularly Māori students. In 2016, Melinda was awarded a prestigious Marsden Fast Start grant to undertake a research project examining the distinctive identity traits of her iwi Ngāpui, New Zealand's largest iwi, and in 2017, she was awarded an esteemed Rutherford Discovery Fellowship to tackle an important question facing educators. How can we foster cultural pride and academic aspiration amongst Maori students? Melinda's work strongly influences gifted education in New Zealand, where we strive to ensure that the abilities and qualities of all learners are recognized and celebrated. She once wrote a book chapter entitled Gifted and Proud, which is the inspiration behind Gifted NZ's conference buttons. On consulting with Melinda, she advised me on the Te Māori language to use, Kia tu rangatira ai, which means to stand in our cheapliness or to stand like chiefs. Melinda is a national treasure to us. She is Tawanga. And on behalf of our professional association for gifted education, I am pleased you are each able to learn and connect with Melinda today as I have over the last 20 years. Please join me in welcoming Melinda to the 2019 World Council for Gifted and Talented Children to present her keynote address, Unleashing Indigenous Potential, the Purpose, Power and Promise of Gifted Education. Mana, 
which is a, a profoundly powerful psychosocial construct in the Māori world, which refers to one sense of efficacy, cultural pride, or standing in the community. So you need to remember that word mana. It's the, it's the thing that every child is born with, a fire that burns within them, their purpose in the world. And in the Māori world, we refer to that as mana, someone's mana. I'll then discuss the findings of Ka Awatea, a New Zealand study of Māori giftedness that utilised a strength-based approach to explain how gifted Māori students can thrive and flourish when a broad range of academic, cultural and social opportunities are afforded to them. But first, I'm sorry. But first, I want to start this keynote by outlining my genealogy as a means of locating myself in a culturally appropriate manner to illustrate the ways that Indigenous identity can be a powerful and enduring aspect of self and to emphasise the importance of these identity matters to our work as educators and researchers in the field of gifted education. I do this also to emphasise the importance of positionality, to be clear that I'm a member of the communities I research for. Stating one's positionality is an important act in many Indigenous cultures. It sends a very strong signal about whether you're working alongside, with, and for communities, or doing research to, or on communities. I also do this as a means of asserting that every Indigenous family, community, tribe, and nation has its own distinct understandings of giftedness, a rich history of gifted flourishing, and an aspirational vision for the future. So my mother descends from tribes in the very north of New Zealand, and we have strong genealogical links to Māori, New Zealand's largest tribe. This is my mother's side, where we come from in the very far north. I descend from gifted individuals, such as Hineamaru, an eminent leader of great standing, who prior to European settlement in New Zealand was famed for her agricultural skills. She too grew lots of potatoes and, and kumara, sweet potato in New Zealand. Her sharp intellect and her strategic leadership of her tribe during times of war, adversity and transition. Rauri Taifanga, the dapper young man up there with the hat on, who was New Zealand's first commercial dairy farmer, known for his industrious nature, bold initiative, risk-taking, task commitment, and enterprise. And lastly, this important gentleman on the end, Sir Heke Nukumai Busby, a world-renowned expert in building, engineering, seafaring, and traditional navigation of the great Pacific Ocean, the largest ocean on Earth, equating to approximately one-third of the Earth's surface area. Despite its expanse, it was traversed and populated by Polynesian navigators who engineered waka, which are double-hulled double sea voyaging vessels. My great uncle, Sir Hike Nukumai Busby, was a gifted individual who not only sat at the feet of his elders to learn, to listen and learn about how to navigate the ocean using indigenous knowledge of the ocean currents, clouds, star constellations and bird life, but also learned how to build ocean-going vessels using traditional techniques from our indigenous relations throughout Oceania. He went on to build multiple waka and, had, and established a school of Pacific navigation to teach future generations this knowledge and skill set. Now, Aotearoa New Zealand has a large number of waka builders and ocean navigators, which ensures the continuation of these knowledges skills and the gifted potential of Māori students who wish to pursue their passion for science, mathematics, design, oceanography and engineering. My father descends from Ngāti Whakauri. No, none of them are my father, I was just pointing. <laughs> <laughs> A tribe based in and around Rotorua, which is essentially the Lakes District of Aotearoa, New Zealand. I descend from gifted tribal members such as Sir Peter Tapsell, the one in the middle, who was an orthopaedic surgeon who became the first Māori speaker of the New Zealand House of Representatives in 1993. He is described in our tribal narratives 
is motivated, stoic, and always able to cope with challenges in a measured and dignified manner. These are highly valued attributes in our culture. Tamata Kapua, at the end, who was the navigator of the Te Waka uh, in the 1300s, and he is celebrated for his scientific expertise, his tenacity, his risk-taking, and his strength of character. And lastly, the scholarly Makariti Papakura, a very beautiful woman here in the middle. Makariti was the first Māori woman to attend Oxford University in the late 1920s to complete her master's degree in child development and ethnography. Makariti was completing her master's at the same time Lev Vygotsky was writing about social cultural theory. And like Lev, Makariti also asserted that individual development cannot be understood without reference to the social and cultural context in which is it embedded, in which it is embedded. She too argued that higher mental processes in individuals have their origins in social processes. She too contested Piaget's idea that cognitive development is universal across cultures. Now in mainstream New Zealand, Makariti is most well known for being a tourist guide, an entertainer, However, with an outram, besides her intellectual acumen, she was revered for her motivation, her grit, passion, and commitment to advancing her own knowledge. She is, in our eyes, one of the most gifted individuals to emerge in our recent history. And yet, she is really included in discussions of academic exceptionality in the New Zealand context. Now, I've used my genealogy here to illustrate that our indigenous communities are hopeful. We are not a problem to be solved. We already have a rich history of giftedness. We already know who is gifted in our communities. I encourage you to celebrate the rich histories and scholarly endeavours of indigenous peoples and become more familiar with what drives indigenous success and how communities themselves conceptualise it. Sadly, I never learned anything about Ngāpuhi or Te Arawa, our rich history of scientific endeavour, or our gifted ancestors at school. And I should have. I was schooled in those tribal areas. The curriculum should have been localised to ensure I learned as much about the engineer and navigator, Sahiki Nukumai Busby, or the socio-cultural socio scholar, Makariti Papakura, as I did about British cartographer, Captain James Cook, or nuclear physicist, Sir Ernest Rutherford. We need to ensure gifted indigenous students know via our curriculum and the look, sound, and feel of our organisations that they descend from greatness too. We need to arm them. Thank you. We need to arm them with a powerful and promising narrative about who they were, who they are now, and who they can become. A narrative that speaks back to negative stereotypes in the mainstream media and the ruinous stories about Indigenous peoples they see in nearly every context, every day. My research has shown that most gifted contexts don't speak the language of Indigenous students. <coughs> They really include their ways of knowing in the curriculum, and they almost never hold Indigenous people up as role models of success or academic excellence. Yet, Indigenous people know, by way of our genealogy, our cultural narratives, and our history of passing on knowledge by a song, prayer, and oratory, that we descend from a long lineage of academic excellence. And the discourses within Indigenous communities don't focus on academic underachievement and deficit either. Instead, the focus is on the strengths, wisdom and opportunities gifted in stu Indigenous students need to flourish. Indigenous families have told me that they want their children to learn and thrive in educational contexts that teach them that their ancestors were exceptional, not uneducable. My research has also shown that there's a strong relationship between positive Indigenous identity and the educational outcomes of Indigenous students. 
The underpinning assertion is that a positive sense of Indigenous identity experienced as cultural competence, academic efficacy and cultural pride can improve the educational outcomes of Indigenous students by ameliorating the negative experiences across multiple consecutive educational contexts. And it is for these reasons that Indigenous wisdoms, distinct knowledge and role models matter. Tailoring our educational programs to emphasise the relevance of Indigenous languages, cultures and identities, as well as our rich history of scientific endeavour, to gifted students' future selves could be an important remedy to the continuing failures of many educational programs in terms of engaging and retaining Indigenous students. But there are a growing number of gifted Indigenous students who are not just attaining educational success, but thriving in our schooling contexts. Educational psychology has much to learn from these students, and it is incumbent upon us to empirically analyse the drivers of their success. My research examines how self-perceptions about the value of their Indigenous identity and family support affect the motivation and academic engagement of gifted Māori students in New Zealand. I have long argued that little will be done to improve gifted Indigenous students' academic engagement and socio-emotional well-being until educators focus specifically on the development of students' connectedness to their Indigenous identity and their sense of mana. Gifted Indigenous students must reconcile the space that exists between their Indigenous identities and their gifted identities. Sometimes that space is a yawning chasm. If we continue to accept the ongoing absence of gifted Indigenous students in our programs, then we also accept that ind gifted Indigenous students don't matter. <laughs> now, research tells us that gifted student engagement in school contexts is dependent on a number of factors. A, the skills, background, knowledge and resources available to both students and teachers. B, the students' psychosocial attributes, including how they are identified and identify as belonging to or in educational settings. And C, how the educational settings make space and provide support and opportunities for gifted students. This sense of belonging and invitation to an educational space is particularly important for Indigenous student engagement and willingness to persist. In this sense, educational engagement can be said to be a function of developing both a school-based identity and an academic or gifted identity. And yet, other important social identities don't disappear when students enter the school context. Therefore, an important question is how academic and social identities necessary for educational achievement intersect with Indigenous identities to support or constrain gifted student educational engagement, persistence and thriving. Now, in light of that question, Sabatnik, Zalski and Worrell's 2011 definition of giftedness is really useful in terms of thinking about the multiple influences on giftedness and talent development. According to these eminent scholars, giftedness, is, giftedness A reflects the values of society, B is typically manifested in actual outcomes, especially in adulthood, C is specific to domains of endeavour, D is a result of the coalescing of biological, pedagogical, psychological and psychosocial factors. And E is relative not just to the ordinary, but to the extraordinary. A number of keynotes and other presenters at this conference have also made reference to a number of psychosocial characteristics that are important to gifted student thriving more generally. However, Another important variable affecting the achievement of gifted Indigenous students is their sense of embedded achievement. The extent research suggests that gifted Indigenous students need to develop and maintain particular affective and psychosocial strengths 
in order to reconcile their gifted selves with their indigenous selves. This is important because most educational settings don't make sufficient use of indigenous language, culture and identity. And it's no surprise that many gifted indigenous students feel that school success has absolutely nothing to do with their indigenous selves. Embedded achievement, a term coined by Daphna Oyserman and her colleagues from Michigan University, refers to believing that racial ethnic group membership involves valuing and achieving in academics. A gifted indigenous student with a sense of embedded achievement would believe that succeeding academically is a key part of being indigenous in a way to enact their indigenous identity. They would also believe that their success helps other indigenous students to succeed too. Because negative stereotypes about indigenous students include low academic achievement, disengagement from school, and a lack of academic ability, indigenous students may be less able to recruit sufficient motivational attention to over override these messages and stay focused on school success. In fact, it's darn hard to stay focused on school success when those are the messages around you every day. By viewing achievement and giftedness as a part of being indigenous, identifica identification with this goal may be more easily facilitated. If gifted indigenous students have a sense of embedded achievement, and believe their teachers expect them to do well, they're more likely to persevere with challenging learning activities with increased effort and tenacity. When gifted students experience success, they simultaneously develop and enhance their self-confidence, self-efficacy, growth mindset, and increase, the per and increase the perceived value of academic tasks and opportunities. When Indigenous students have a sense of embedded achievement, they believe they can and will be successful because they're Māori or Indigenous, not despite being Indigenous. <laughs> Your claps are surprising me. <laughs> now, Indigenous scholars in the field of gifted education have provided a number of useful insights in terms of understanding how giftedness is defined and identified in their communities. In general, across the majority of the research, it is argued that gifted Indigenous students must be encouraged to value their culture and see it as a meaningful and relevant part of academic learning. Research by Māori scholars suggests that culturally responsive learning activities increase self-esteem and confidence, resulting in gifted Māori students being more likely to develop their gifted potential. The overarching argument is that to engage gifted Māori learners Teaching and learning strategies need to be culturally appropriate and the focus should be on a curriculum that is culturally meaningful and relevant. Scholar Jill Bevan Brown has noted some key differences between Māori and non-Māori conceptions of giftedness. For example, Māori strongly believe in service to others, group benefit and group giftedness. This refers to the notion that giftedness emerges as a result of people working together Individuals may have expertise, but it is only when working in a particular group context that their expertise becomes collectively heightened to an outstanding level. The gifted ability may be perceived as belonging to the group rather than to just the individual. Bevan Brown notes that, that the notion of a self-made man does not fit comfortably with Māori culture. While individual effort is applauded, especially if it involves battling against adversity, individuals themselves are always viewed within the context of their family and community. And in a, in a study of Indigenous Australian conceptions of giftedness, Professor Michael Christie has argued that giftedness is associated with leadership. The Indigenous Australian elders who participated in his study stated that gifted Indigenous students are the ones who help the other kids when the teacher is not watching. They're not competitive. They already know that they are people with destiny. They know the authority of their elders. They also know how to pay attention to significant people and also places, things and moment. moments. Similarly, Professor Paul Chandler also stated that from an Aboriginal perspective, Giftedness is a measure of your knowledge of your ancestry, 
your land, your kin, and your respect for your community and elders. That is what giftedness is. And with being identified as a leader or a gifted person of any kind comes enormous responsibility. You're expected to care for certain family groups. You're expected to care for certain totems for your and for your natural environment. Similarly, in work undertaken by Fa'ea Semiatu, 10 Pacific cultural identifiers were developed to illuminate Pacific understandings of giftedness, particularly Samoan um, understandings of giftedness. This author concluded that gifted Pacific students are culturally flexible in both Pacific and non-Pacific contexts. As needed, they can recite, formally recite customs, protocols, family ancestral history. They can transfer their skills and experiences from church to the community to the school context. For example, in public speaking, showing respect, behaving in, accord in accordance to social norms, and questioning for understanding or clarification. In addition, gifted Pacifica students seek opportunities to excel and pursue excellence for family pride and also personal achievement. They actively use their talents in music, sport, academic achievement, social experience, and create events for themselves to showcase their abilities. They see setbacks as opportunities to aim even higher and achieve their personal best so that they are able to react more positively in any given situation. Finally, this author states that many gifted Pacific students speak, understand, or write in their mother tongue, serve faithfully in church and family contexts, and work to raise the status and prestige of their parents by virtue of success in job and career opportunities. And finally, one indigenous perspective uh, from the Native American setting. Professor Michael Brokenleg, a Rosebud a Rosebud Sioux scholar, has argued that if Native American concepts of learning were honoured in schools, children would be captivated by stories rather than bored by lectures. Song, dance, art and creativity would be valued as much as traditional academic subjects or sports. Children would help one another to achieve rather than seeking to mock the slow child or make fun of their gifted peers. Attention would be given to active, searching minds rather than a focus on needs and deficit. Every person with a talent or skill would feel an obligation to share it with others. The traditional knowledge passed on from elders would be revered rather than ignored. Spiritual truths would be valued as well. Children would learn how to fail courageously rather than retreat in futility. They would be taught how to handle fear and express compassion. Learning would be cross-generational and children would have a core group of adult mentors who could name them and claim them and whose relationship with them would transcend time and curriculum. Uh, Professor Martin Brokenleg argues that love, not teaching, is the essence of education. And that in cultures and communities where adults are securely bonded to children, learning flourishes. The commonalities across the four Indigenous groups just discussed suggest that the educative process for gifted Indigenous students must strengthen their cultural connections, increase their cultural competence, and enhance their sense of belonging to the communities of interest, including the school community, while simultaneously improving their academic motivation to learn and succeed. As such, gifted education providers must work harder to cultivate a climate in which family, tribal, and wider community organisations can feel comfortable to initiate involvement in education and should, um, should provide them with appropriate opportunities to do so. Research has shown that genuine school, family and community partnership is critical because students learn more and succeed at higher levels when home, school and community work together and are on the same page. Now across the four cultures, there were particular words, the four cultural groups, particular words that were repeated throughout the literature. And they all mean a very similar thing. In the Māori 
uh, context they talked about mana, which is that quality or energy inside every child. In the Tongan context, they talked about this idea of puku, which is the ability to match their behaviours to the context, that innate knowing what to do in a particular context. In Australia, one of the groups, the Yongnu, talked about gakal. And gakal is a, is a, is a knowledge of cult cultural ways of knowing and ceremony that enable their indi the individual to become one with their ancestors. And then in the Alaskan context, a phrase that was repeated quite often was yani da'a, which is associated with ancient teachings that provide students with the skills necessary for success at school, but also um, helps them to, to be connected to their own cultures. There are these common, they're different words, but they mean the same thing across all of them. How can we foster these things in our own school contexts? We can. And I want to talk to you about a particular project that we did in the New Zealand context that shows that we can do it. Uh, this project was called Ka Awatea, and it was originally called a tribal case study of, gifted, of Māori giftedness. However, the Māori community I come from don't use or like the word gifted. They talk about their children being good learners or being successful. So we, we changed the name of the project to a tribal case study of Māori student success. Um, this project was undertaken, uh, was facilitated by four Te Arawa researchers. So from the Rotorua region, the Lakes region, all four of the people up there come from that region, were born there, speak the language, had taught there, and are known members of the community. Now, the Kaomatea study sought to understand the role that various social, academic, interpersonal and cultural influences have on the academic engagement of our smartest Māori students. All of the gifted students in this uh, study who completed the questionnaire, an interview or a focus group, were year, year 11 to 13 students aged 15 to 18 years. There was a very basic criterion for inclusion. Basically, they had to self-identify as Māori, Uh, they had to be senior students in their um, last three years of school. They had to have been identified by their school or their family or each other as gifted or successful or good learners. And they had to preferably, but not necessarily, be of Tarawa descent. So we, we were hoping to get students from our own tribal area. And 60% of the cohort that were involved were actually Tarawa. Um, all of the students were Māori. Now, Students were initially nominated by teachers and principals in schools, and we didn't have a definition for them. We just said, send us your best and brightest and most successful Māori students. And by and large, the school sent us their high academic achievers and their school leaders, the kinds of kids who were the captain of the rugby team or the president of the chess club and things like that. Um, when we asked the students and their families who else we needed to talk to, they spoke about very different gifted qualities. They talked about, they said things like, oh, you really need to speak to Tracy. Because when somebody at school doesn't have a friend to play with at lunchtime, or they're new to the school, Tracy always looks after them. She takes care of people. Everyone loves Tracy. So they nominated kids for very different kinds of personal qualities um, that were important for building and maintaining relationships in the, social, in the school context. So as you can see from here, we had 283 participants in the study altogether, and we had asked three questions in general. We sought to answer three questions. One, how do Te Arawa, our specific tribe, define giftedness? Two, in what ways do families, teachers, and the wider Te Arawa community foster the conditions that enable giftedness to manifest? What are they doing? What are the kinds of rituals and routines they have at home that encourage their, their, their students to persist at school, regardless of what's going on for them? I mean, there's a million things going on for teenagers at school. And our kids don't come to school just to acquire an academic identity. And in fact, for many of them, their social identities were equally as important. Um, and how is giftedness enacted by these students? 
to what effect? So if we give kids a label like, you know, task commitment or they're risk takers or they're very resilient, <coughs> so what? What does that actually, how does it help them at school? How does it impact the ways they engage in learning or with others in the school context? So we were really interested in the ways these labels or behaviours impacted their learning at school. Now, there were eight gifted qualities that emerged in the study. They're now used as identification criteria inside uh, the schools in Little Tua District. And in essence, the first quality, you can see there were said successful Māori students, not gifted Māori students. These slides were used in the presentation back uh, to community. Now the first quality, I hope you can read them, um, is that gifted or successful Māori students have a positive sense of Māori identity. This was critical and that's why it's number one. Many of these students that we talked to and the families that they come from, came from talked about being Māori in a positive way. They had a sense of embedded achievement. To them, being Māori was a cultural asset. It was something that, in the words of one young man, he said, I want to be a lawyer when I grow up. I'm going to get a job before anybody else because I'm a lawyer who can speak two languages, have access to two communities, you know, two knowledge systems. I'm very desirable, auntie, he said to me. Um, and when the teachers described these students, they talked about the, the characteristics of these students. They talked about things like they have a belief and knowledge in them, of themselves. They have a strength of character, a boldness, a strong will real personality. They're often the kids that drive you a bit nuts in the class. You know, you're the ones where you're on question two and they're already asking questions about question ten on a piece of paper. Um, they're the ones that push the limits a lot. Um, and we've all got students like that in our classrooms, including university classrooms. Um, when we ask parents in particular, so what? If kids have a positive identity, what does that mean? The key thing they said was, it means they can be resilient to negative stereotypes. One of the mums said, my daughter has Wonder Woman bands. And I said, hmm? She said, you know those bands that Wonder Woman were used to wear? And when the baddies came towards her, she, you could almost see her go kapow, kapow, to rebel them. When her cousins say things like, a lawyer? Māori aren't lawyers, Māori are criminals. She said, I just see a look of disdain wash across my daughter's face that says, you are the dumbest person <laughs> I've ever met. They're often her cousins. But that was what a positive sense of Māori identity meant for these students. The second thing that families and students talked about, and teachers, was that successful or gifted Māori students are diligent and they have an internal locus of control. Okay? By diligent, they meant that these students knew that learning took a sacrifice of time and effort. Things don't come quickly all the time. You know, um, they talked about um, an, internal, um, an internal locus of control. Many of these students said things like, my success is my whole family's success. My failure is my whole family's failure. So learning and success at school was of critical importance to these young people. It was a high stakes endeavour and they weren't taking that for granted. So those were some of the things that they talked about. Now you can also see with each of these characteristics that we then went back and did a second study after we'd interviewed all the students, which was to ask our elders, our parents talked a lot about positive identity and the importance of it. Is this something new for Te Aroa? And I was like, oh no, Te Aroa have always been bold. Te Aroa have always, you know, be the first ones to get up and sing or the first ones to get on the dance floor, for all that's just how we are. So we associated each of the characteristics with a, with a Tarawa icon. Because we wanted our kids to know this is not a new thing. Tarawa, we descend from greatness. We have stories riddled with these characteristics. Um, so I wanted to point out the pictures, they're not just there to look pretty. Um, the third I don't have time to go into a huge amount of detail because I've got a lot more to talk about. But the, the third quality was about relationships. And in the New Zealand literature, we hear a lot about the importance of teachers building relationships with students. Well, these kids said something different. These young people said the smartest kids know how to build and sustain relationships, especially with the teachers they don't like. Because 
those teachers hold the key to their success. So they said things like, you know, that one child said, I metaphorically midi midi, which means massage, I metaphorically midi midi the shoulders of my teachers so that they'll give me some one-on-one -on -one time. Okay? There's this mistaken belief that Māori kids or Indigenous kids prefer group work and group feedback. These kids said, no, we want our one-on-one -on -one feedback. We want time with you to tell us how we can get better. So one young man I spoke to, he said, I've worked out that if I help my teachers, they'll help me. So I say at the end of the class, sir, can I carry your books to the next classroom for you? Because in New Zealand, teachers change classrooms as they teach. And the teachers say, yes, thank you. He said, I pick up the box, I walk really slowly, and I say, so I only got a C on my last assignment. I'm just wondering what I can do differently. Very clever, young people. The fourth quality was around curiosity and innovation, and the kids talked a lot about the opportunities that school um, afforded them. Many of these kids would never have, well, they came from families that um, couldn't afford to send them on the trips they went on, that they were able to go out on a boat with some marine biologists and do science out there, or go to Parliament and sit and listen to our crazy politicians arguing for a day. Most of the children we interviewed had never left Rotorua. Okay, they never left their hometown. So they talked a lot about, in terms of innovation, what they were actually talking about is the ability to take information or subject matter learned in one curriculum area and apply those tools in another curriculum area. So they talked about things like um, mathematical formulas, especially algebra. Lots of them talked about algebra, you know, algebraic formula or theories that they then when they were learning in design, for example, in their design classes, they could see how those formulas helped them. Others talked about, I'm the captain of my league team, and I learned that the skills I have in terms of organising a team on the sports field are the same skills I need in terms of organising people around me in other, in other school subjects. And you know, the interesting thing is that in Māori, the word for leader is rangatira. And Ramatira is made up of two words. One, Rarama, which means to weave. And the second part is Tira, which is a group. So a Ramatira, or a leader, is somebody able to weave people together for a common purpose. Very important construct when you're thinking about leadership. It's not an individual trait. It's something that brings people together. The fifth quality, I always talk too much on these, so I'm going Bit slowly. The uh, fifth quality was around well-being. And lots of this, this wasn't something that we anticipated, but every child we spoke to said, if I'm not well, I can't learn. If I don't have an outlet for my sadness, somebody to talk to about my anger, I can't concentrate in class. So they talked a lot about the relationships they built with their peers, but they also talked about something that one student called touchstone teachers. One of the students said, I have a touchstone teacher. And I said, what is that? And he said, you know when you go to a river and you see those big rocks and the water's just skimming across the top and you just want to put your hands on it? I've got a teacher like that. When I'm having a bad day, I can say, Miss, can I just sit in your classroom and eat my lunch? He said, I go in there, we don't even talk for the hour. She just carries eat too, lunch and I eat one. Sometimes we'll chat, this teacher likes me. This teacher doesn't talk to me about attendance or the wrong uniform. This teacher only talks to me about me and things I care about. Every child needs a touchstone teacher. It's critical to their well-being and their learning. The sixth quality was aligned with my, my ancestor, Makariti Papakura, and that's that these kids were committed to their scholarly endeavours. They knew where they wanted to be. They were aspirational. They knew that learning to learn or to achieve your goals, you have to set smaller goals and work towards them. Now, when Makariti went to Oxford University, her family fundraised, and she family fundraised for four years to get there. In the 1920s, it was an eight-week ship ride to London. She left her two children behind to be looked after by her parents. Um, and her parents fundraised the entire time she was there for her lodgings. So to pursue one's academic endeavours or aspirations takes a lot of sacrifice. Not just for you, but for those around you. So in Te Arawa, we revere Makariti Papakura for her persistence, for her commitment to the things, and the family that surrounded her. So many of these young people could apply themselves, because they knew what they wanted to do. 
They had a conversation with many of their teachers. Um, there's a secondary kids, and the, uh, this one student said to me, when I meet with my teacher, she says, do you still want to be a pilot? Yes. Have you found out where you need to go to be a pilot? Yes, it's Arden. Have you found out the entry requirements? In year 13, yes, it's this. So what does that mean you need to do in year 13? What are the prerequisites for that? And it's that kind of back planning idea. Now, teenagers are not going to do that unless you teach them how to do that. Um, so that's what they talked about in terms of um, that sixth quality. The seventh quality is a really important one, and I think it's misunderstood. Successful Māori students possess humility. Now, in the New Zealand context, many teachers will say, oh yes, Māori kids are too humble. You know, it's terrible. They won't stand up in front of the class. They won't share their work with others. They get too embarrassed. And I say to them, well, that's not humility. That's embarrassment. There's something about that social context which means those kids don't feel safe to stand up and talk. And that's not necessarily the teacher. It's more often than not peer dynamics, actually, in the class. Humility is instead service to others, being a team player, knowing that sometimes you have to let somebody else get that award or certificate because you always get them. It's about, in the words of one young man, knowing that when my flame burns brightly, it should never blow anyone else's out. So they talked a lot about humility. And hum being humble allows you to sustain relationships. So that even if, like in relationships with teachers, even if you give me a bad mark and it's not the mark I wanted, if I'm humble enough to come back and ask for your help, ask how I can get better, if I see the feedback you give me as a gift, then I can sustain a relationship with you. That is humility. Very important cultural construct. And the eighth one was around, the eighth quality was about gifted Māori students understand core community values. They know what matters for their community, and it's different, it's nuanced for every community. In Māori communities, it's about a word called manākitanga, which is about cherishing the mana of others, that your actions should never diminish somebody. If they are, if, you, if there's something negative you want to say, you should walk away, because those people are your relations. Those people are members of your community. So it was one of the core values. They talked about kotahitanga a lot, which is about unity of vision. Making sure you, your teacher, your peers, all understand what it is we have to learn. And then really importantly, these teenagers talked about having a moral compass. They talked about it all the time, social justice. Now, I know the difference between right and wrong. One young man in our study said to me, when I first got to my school, my cousins would say to me at lunchtime, oh, let's go down and get some fish and chips and go to the lake, which basically means let's wag the afternoon. That's, is, do you use the word wag here? Yeah? Pardon? Cut class. Let's cut class for the afternoon. <laughs> and he said, and I didn't want to cut class, you know, I, but I didn't know how to say to them, eh, no, I want to do really well at school. He said, so what I did was, is I signed up for a whole heap of different extracurricular activities. On Monday, I was a librarian's assistant. On Tuesday, I was a runner for the office. On Wednesday, I was in chess club. And because my cousins understand when I say, oh, no, I've already committed to something. Sorry, I've got this at lunch. They understand, oh, he's committed. So he won't do it. Whereas if I just said, no, I don't want to come with you guys, it's really hard to explain yourself out of that, especially when they're all your cousins. Very clever young person. So those were the eight qualities, or the eight criteria for giftedness in our community. We were also able to develop a model, and this is called the MANA model. And basically, do you remember uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs? So this model is a little bit similar in that it's hierarchical. Okay, so we start at the bottom. The absolute critical thing for Māori, gifted Māori students to flourish is that they have to have a sense of connectedness to others and collective agency. So they have to believe that they are an important person in their community and their family, and that includes their school family, that somebody in that space sees them, sees that fire in them. Once they have that, they're able to develop a sense of belonging and relationship to place. That, that sense that I belong in the school context because my teachers value this, because the school is settled on these lands, and we know the stories of these lands. Um, they also talked a lot about at the next level, a sense of embedded achievement and self-concept. Um, up from that, then we can develop those psychosocial skills that we talk about all the time. In particular, they talked about efficacy, that belief in self, the belief that they can achieve something, motivation, courage, humility, 
tenacity, and of course, a growth mindset. And at the very top of the model, they talked about something called mana tamata. And mana tamata, sorry, it's meant to say mana tamata rua, the word rua means two, which was basically the knowledge and skills of two peoples, our own and the dominant culture. Now, in cities like Nashville, it's going to be tangata maha, many peoples, the knowledge, because these are such multicultural contexts. But our kids don't want to just be Māori. They want to be Māori and flourish in the world. They want to be Māori and understand other cultures. But they also want other cultures to know who they are so that they can respect who Māori are. So they talked about those. That was one of the models we developed. And we also were able to develop a range of recommendations. You don't need to read these to know what they are. But we have recommendations for Māori students from Māori students. Not from us, not from old researchers who work in universities. No one's going to listen. Kids aren't going to listen to us. We said to the students, what advice would you give to other Māori students about thriving at school? And one of the, one of the young men we spoke to said, my mum always tells me, if you want to fly like an eagle, stop hanging out with turkeys. <laughs> it's one of my favourite ones. We have recommendations for whānau. Whānau means family in our language. So we ask the families, your children have been nominated for this study. You're clearly doing an amazing job. If you could identify one thing that makes the difference for your kids, what would it be? Lots of the parents talked about teaching their kids coping skills. So when things go wrong, what do you do? You don't slam the door and cry in your room, listening to sad love songs, thinking they're about you because your girlfriend dropped you and all of those kinds of things. You strategize to get out of that situation. So, and they also talked about lots of kind of small family rituals that they had that emphasized the importance of education to their children. So one dad I spoke to said, for example, in our family we get up at 5.45 a.m. every weekday, we go into the lounge and we all work together on our homework or help each other. Sometimes I have my own work to do, but we do it for an entire hour. Then at 6.45 a.m., we're going to have a shower, our breakfast, and we go to school, go our own ways. And I said, oh, that sounds really terrible, getting up at 5.45 a.m. every day. This dad was in the army. Um, he said to me, you know, after school, there's a million things that can get in the way of a family spending a whole hour just learning together. You know, after work meetings, sports practices, the need to get dinner ready, etc. No one's ever doing anything at 5.45 a.m., he said. <laughs> so that was one of the things. And when I interviewed his daughters, he had two daughters nominated for the study, they both said, oh, we get everything out of the way in the morning. So I play representative netball, I do these things in the afternoon, because that, this is how our family values education. We have recommendations for policy makers, because we spoke to so many of them, teachers in schools, and recommendations for EU, which is the rest of our tribe. Um, this PowerPoint will be made available to anyone via the website, so you can look at those in more depth if you like. <coughs> now, when we took this study, these are just my last few slides, when we took this study back to our tribal area and presented it to them, to, to, to get them to verify it, to get them to add things that they thought were important, they did three really important things. It's not often your research gets picked up and used and turned into something really amazing. We were really lucky that this research did. The first thing they did was that they developed a teacher PLD program for all of the primary and secondary schools in our region. It was called Te Rangi Haka Haka, which means to aspire to lofty heights. And basically this PLD program was free to any school and any teacher in the region who wanted to participate in three weekend intensives to learn about things like the names of places, the importance of particular rivers, what this mountain, you know, the, the landmarks of our particular, and the important people. Now, this project was picked up like nobody's business. Schools just flocked to learn it. So in the first four years, over 595 teachers signed up to that PLD program. And there were a whole heap of changes that happened to the schools in our area, including things like one school changing its name completely to better reflect the area that it came from. Um, schools renaming their house groups after the six important ancestors of our area. Um, and most of the schools started implementing elements of our science inside of their schools. There was a range of things that happened. They also started what is called Matakokere, which is a school holiday program that also ran, started uh, running back in 2014, I think it was. Um, and what happens in these holiday programs is that any Ngāti Whakaui, Te Arawa child, 
um, in the region and their parents, if they want to attend a week-long holiday program focused on science, local science, they could come in, and it was free for their children, as long as they had to attend with a parent or grandparent or some family member. And local scientists would come in and they would conduct experiments. Um, and there was a whole range of different subjects you can see there. Land, one, one um, school holidays was land, next school holidays it was fresh water. In the second week, so they did that for five days, going out and doing science in our local community. Learning about dams, learning about aquifers, learning about tides, etc. Then in the second week of the holidays, any teacher in the Tiarawa region could come and do exactly the same program that the kids and their families did with the science scientists so that they would go back to school with the same knowledge base, able to learn together. Um, so that was an amazing program. Uh, and uh, nearly 500 students participated in these, in these programs, um, over 240 families, and we had over 100 scientists and technology experts from our local universities volunteer their time. We had money to pay them. They all volunteered their time to participate in this. And then the last thing that happened was that our tribe established their own school. They said, the schools in our region, I mean, this is a very different system from the American system, remember? We, we have self-governing schools in New Zealand, so they're not governed by a central department of education. Each school is given a particular amount of money, told to meet these criteria and achieve these limits, and, but you can do it how you like, is basically what they say. So our, our EU decided to establish a Centre for Science and Technology and this school is available to all um, Māori students in the area who want to um, learn across all of the subject areas, but it be focused mostly on science. So the starting point is always science for our kids. And the, the school was built on the eight identification criteria from our study. So basically the graduate student profile says our kids will leave culturally flexible. By the time our kids graduate from the school, they will, they will be resilient and understand what leadership is, etc. So that was another one of the findings of the outcomes from our study. So what did we find? Well, in essence, we found that gifted Indigenous students are more likely to express their giftedness if they are proudly Indigenous. It seems so simple. But actually, getting young people to a place where they feel proud about being Indigenous in contexts that are often the absolute opposite of their own indigenous communities, is quite tricky. Um, they wanted to operate, um, they can express their giftedness if they operate from a position of mana, by adding dignity to others and providing positive transformation back to their communities and, and people. In, in our school in Utu, we don't talk about community problem solving, because our community is not a problem to be solved. We talk about purposeful learning in our community. Uh, I talked about our kids have to be passionate, persistent, aspirational. They have to be connected to others in their kinship group. They have to have positive Indigenous role models in their lives. This is critical for our young people, and critical in terms of who we are including in our school context. They have to have touchstone teachers. They have to be humble and demonstrate a service ethic. They have to work for the common good. That was something parents said all the time. And they have to be curious about the opportunities and possibilities of integrating their own knowledge with Western knowledge. Because uh, we have our own scientific systems, we have our own knowledge systems. So, we must challenge, to conclude, we must challenge the normalisation of failure when we speak about Indigenous students and their communities. Especially if we're in a department or workplace that has grown accustomed to the idea that students from certain backgrounds will underperform and nothing can be done about it. This is more often a reflection of the gaps in our own knowledge than it is of student deficit. If what we are doing is not making the positive difference we thought it might with a group of Indigenous students, we need to do more work and to find alternative research and pedagogical approaches, like the ones presented throughout this conference. We must change our practice not reinforce the message that the problem rests with the students in their communities. We hear that all the time. They are not the problem. We must also seek out the advice of positive deviants. Seek advice from the Indigenous students who are performing well and find out what's different about them and their experience.
because those outliers will tell you what we need to do more of. They are certain strategies that they know from experience are more likely to lead to success. And we need to make sure gifted Indigenous students who are thriving tell gifted Indigenous students who are languishing what those strategies are. And as evidenced by many of the sessions I've attended here at the World Conference, there are lots of examples of educational organisations that are serving gifted Indigenous students well. All kinds. And the existence of those organisations are the proof that the problem is not the student. The problem is our inability to build and sustain the conditions that foster good teaching and learning. That's what we should be focusing on. How to create the conditions to enable our educators to be effective at what they do. We must differentiate our curriculum. Teaching and learning, te curriculum, teaching and learning environments so they are desirable, relevant and responsive to Indigenous students and the families, nations and communities they carry on their shoulders. So how might we transform the processes, content and outcomes of gifted education to, to more effectively meet the academic and socio-cultural aspirations of Indigenous people? A common problematic is our tendency to develop silver bullet interventions or implement cosmetic strategies that only change the shape of, of the minoritised experience for Indigenous students, or perpetrated in new ways. We must move beyond disjointed one-off projects that make good public relations stories, to more transforming processes that challenge gifted organisations and those who work within them, to reconsider what counts as useful, important and valid knowledge. We need, we need institutionally coherent, sustainable and transformative approaches that amplify Indigenous ways of knowing, being and doing in gifted education. Indigenous students and their communities have already told us what would positively transform gifted education for them. The real question is whether we are truly committed to making the changes required. Thank you very much. the gods and the dead into the space with us. Men's voices speak to the living. Women's voices can speak to the dead and the gods. So that's why we sing. <laughs> Thank you, Melinda. And the words in English that we just sang were love, hope, peace for us all. So we're very fortunate um, to have had this experience, to learn from Melinda, um, and I invite you all to please take a button, please reach out to Melinda and continue to, to share this Indigenous knowledge with the world. <laughs>